Chapter 4, The Archetype of Initiation, Lecture, Fall 1985. The archetype of initiation is a topic dear to my heart, and I have worked on it for a long time, so it gives me a real pleasure to interact with you and work with you around it. The topic has a lot of history, and a lot of work has been done on it, but it also has a very practical application. This presentation will first consider some scholarly and research materials on the archetype of initiation, and then look at how it applies to understanding human existence, especially our own lives and how our own struggles as we seek to live in a fulfilled way what Jungians call the individuation process. We Jungians hear a lot about archetypes, but we do not hear much about the archetype of initiation. We hear about the archetype of the wise old man, the archetype of the self, the archetype of the child, and you hear about a number of others, but only recently has this important archetype of initiation received much attention. Since Jung, a few books have discussed the topic at length, except for Joseph Henderson's Thresholds of Initiation. An analyst friend of mine, Louise Madi, is putting together a book of essays on initiation by different Jungian authors that should come out within the next year or two. The Three Phases of Initiation all discussions of the archetype of initiation start with the assumption that life is a series of transformations. As we Jungians use the word transformation, it could be translated initiation. In everyday life, the word initiation usually makes us think of initiation into fraternities and sororities and things like that. But initiation really refers to something that is part and parcel of the universal spiritual journey, the pilgrimage of human life. Initiation is the process of dying and being reborn. This archetype is so powerful in human life that it turns up in all parts of human experience. And once you have the eyes to see it, a lot of things that you have wondered about will begin to fall into place. The archetype of initiation has a tripartite nature, a threefold expression as shown in the three-page diagram 2 in the appendix. Each page represents one of the three phases of the archetype of initiation. The distinction between the three phases helps us understand human experience of these different aspects of initiation. The first phase refers to the sum total of a person's present state of consciousness, the experience of what phenomenological philosophers call the life world. The way the world makes coherent sense to you at your particular place in life. You may not like what sense your world makes, but it does make some coherent sense. It hangs together in some way. You sort of know who you are, and where you are, and where you have been, and where you are going. You might even say in Erickson's terms that you have a psychological identity of some form. Human beings throughout the centuries, however, have noticed painfully that these attainments to a location in life periodically come to an end. There are basically two kinds of reasons for this. One related to the natural life cycle and fairly predictable, and the other related to specific events in a particular person's life and somewhat less predictable. Gail Sheehy wrote the book Passages that popularized the natural processes of initiation, even though she didn't use that language. Daniel Levinson wrote a really helpful book about the various initiations that occur in the adult lives of most men under the titles Seasons of Man's Life. I also recommend Carol Gilligan's book In a Different Voice which talks about the different kind of developmental challenges in women's lives. There is always a situation in which the life world of an individual gets overripe and needs to die. People who can successfully meet this challenge in their lives leave the first phase and cross over the first threshold, which is a pseudo-spiritual death and dismemberment. We might not want to go. We may say, please, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go. I'd rather stay here. Later we will look at how people try to avoid confronting this first threshold of death and dismemberment. The middle phase of initiation is nowhere, limbo, disillusion, hell, sacred space. Everyone has experienced that phase many times. We need to talk about it frankly. This is the tomb, the valley of the whale, the womb of the tomb, the tomb of the womb. If your life is going to go and be expressed as human beings were meant to live, you sometimes have to go into sacred space. In order to be human and keep moving toward a fulfilling life, you need from time to time a destruction of your former consciousness and life world, and this requires incubation. 
but this important experience has a problem. You might decide you really like it there and want to stay. A lot of people stay there all the time and they cannot get out. Some because they don't want to get out, but others because they have no ritual elder to help them get out. Later we will summarize the issues surrounding boundaries and the space that creates the vessel or container for initiation and the role of ritual elders. These issues are important to understanding how the archetype of initiation works as a socially expressed archetype. Sometimes we think of archetypes as just something inside individual heads, but the archetype of initiation expresses itself in social interactions. Once you've been incubated in the womb for an optimal time and you have been cooked just right in the alchemical vessel, then it is time for you to leave phase two and cross the second threshold into phase three, which is back in the ordinary world. This threefold structure that starts and ends in the ordinary world can even be found in Zen Buddhism. In Zen they say that before enlightenment the mountain is just a mountain, that during enlightenment the mountain is no longer a mountain, but that after enlightenment the mountain is once again a mountain. In other words, a return to the ordinary. Spiritual masters of almost every tradition say that enlightenment must bring a return to the ordinary, and the enlightened person must return to the ordinary. You must be able to be ordinary if you want to be enlightened. People who think they are extraordinary are not very enlightened, but any person in the process of initiation will go through phases where they will think they are God, or at least God-like. As one young analyzan of mine said recently, I'm smarter than everybody else. It's important for us not to make fun of that kind of feeling because when you are in this place, you are in touch with 200,020 volts of spiritual and psychological archetypal energy. This is what Jungians mean when they say you are in touch with the self. In Jungian terms, there is no time in your life when you are closer to the self with a capital S than in this middle phase of initiation. You are so close to it that you are glowing. That is why in most cases you need to have someone serving as your ritual elder who knows what they are doing and you need a tight boundary to the experience, a container on all sides, like a womb, like the alchemical alembic, the test tube. I say in most cases, because I always leave open the possibility of an exception. Audience member, is this where Moses was on the mountain and his face shone and he didn't know it was shining? More. On Sinai and every sacred mountain, we need a good book on the role of the sacred mountain in Jungian terms. There are some good historical phenomenological books on sacred mountains, but none that discuss the psychology of it from a Jungian point of view. Sinai is sacred space. Moses takes off his shoes, you know. Put off your shoes because you are standing on holy ground. Notice that Moses did not have any outer ritual elder with him there. Audience member. I once heard a speaker say that if Moses had known his face was shining, it wouldn't have shown. Is that the problem of getting out? More. Without a ritual elder, the temptation to inflation of the ego is inevitable. Inflation presents a problem to anyone who has ever had contact with the sacred, and that includes all of us. The Freudians call it grandiosity. If you are not a little inflated, you are too far away from the sun of the self. Personally, I worry about you if you're not inflated than if you are. There was a time before 10 or 12 years of my own analysis that I would not have said that. But I learned that we all have to deal with our own grandiosity and our own narcissistic issues. I like seeing people who feel alive and important. People who are really depressed do not have close enough connection with the divine powers. That is sadder to me than someone who is manic because they feel the life force. But Moses must come down from the mountain. What is he tempted to do? He is tempted to say, flush those Hebrews, pull the chain. This is a big problem with anyone who has spent time on sacred ground. Once you have been zapped by all that divine energy, like working with an encounter group or having a good session of therapy or analysis, it is hard to go back to ordinary life. Even though you are now enlightened and alive, what about those people out there in the ordinary world? Are they really worth your time anymore? Are they really worth your love? If you have not really cooked well enough, you may decide they are not worth it anymore. Understanding these three phases in the structure of the archetype of initiation will help you make sense out of many of your experiences and the experiences of the people around you. If in your own experiences 
you were fortunate enough to have a good ritual elder helping get in, get cooked, and then get out, you will then be better able to serve as an elder for others around you. Audience member. Would you say that the center phase is the prime time to be in therapy or an encounter group? More. If you are in therapy, you are in the middle phase already. If you are in an encounter group, you are probably in it already. There are other ways a person can be in that phase, however, and as we progress along we will talk about some of them. Here, though we are focusing on therapy and analysis, both group and individual, because these are primary modes of the initiatory process for people who can afford it. Thankfully, however, people will encounter it one way or another because analysts have no corner whatsoever on this process. Arnold Van Genop. The first person to systematize the understanding of initiation was Arnold Van Genop in The Rites of Spring, a classic work now in University of Chicago paperback. Everyone should get a copy of this book and read it. Van Genop studied the rites of initiation by which adolescents entered into adulthood in tribal cultures. Today, of course, we realize that initiation extends far beyond adolescence into all ages and stages of life. But when scholars like Van Genop first studied it around the turn of the century, they focused on adolescent experience. His words, separation from the status of childhood, meant crossing the margins of the lumen and then staying for a while in this state of betwixt and between statuses, and then finally going into what he called aggregation, or the return to the new status of adulthood. That is, you have now become a man, so you can take care of the cattle, or whatever the responsibilities in that tribe were. Van Genoff's book made a big impact in anthropology, but its significance was not really fully realized, because people at that time did not see the general applicability of the initiation process. Later we will look at how Van Genop's work influenced the contributions of Victor Turner. Joseph Campbell The mythologist Joseph Campbell described the structure of initiation in the hero cycle in his important book Hero with a Thousand Faces, adapted for Diagram 3 in the appendix. No one understands this concept better than Joseph Campbell. Though he is not a psychoanalyst, he is brilliant and wise in these matters, and he understands all aspects of the process. At great length, he discusses the entry into initiation, what happens in the middle phase that I call sacred or transformative space-time, and then what happens when someone tries to come back to ordinary life. He lays it all out beautifully in a mythic form. Campbell sees the structure of the archetype of initiation in world mythology, what he calls the universal monomyth. His descriptions are wonderful. He gives many examples from folklore, fairy tale, and various world mythologies about how we are living our life along happy right where we are. We think, then all of a sudden something happens. Maybe you are a young maiden and you are sitting by this nice little pond and all of a sudden this ball rolls by and it rolls down a hole. You go over there and look and all of a sudden you find this passageway. Then the question becomes, will I or won't I? go on and try to figure out what this is and what it means. Campbell designates that kind of experience as the call. It is a radical experience because the call is always a call of transformation, and contrary to commonly held romantic fantasies, it is always scary if it is a real transformation. Many times the call is refused. Why is it refused? According to Campbell, it can be refused because you simply do not pay attention to the fact that you have been called. Each person should stop and think about ways people can be oblivious to the fact that they have been called. How do Jungians talk about that experience? Jungians talk about the fact that the self is constantly initiating. The self is always trying to get the attention of the ego in all sorts of ways. The self is constantly providing a call to get you to pay attention to areas that need transformation at that particular time. For example, you may not be paying enough attention to your dreams. Jungians are not Freudians because we believe that there are many clues coming from the self into a person's life in all sorts of ways that function like Campbell's call. Little clues about what you need to pay attention to. Little clues about what you need to die to and where you need to die. Of course, a lot of the time the ego just doesn't want to see these clues. Audience member, how does prayer tie into this? More. Even prayer can be used to avoid one's call 
Wild prayer consists of turning up the volume of your own voice so you won't have to hear what is being said to you. Think about it in terms of relationships. You can be so busy talking, so busy communicating, and just keeping the water so muddy that you do not see what is true in the relationship. You see this time and again in all relationships. Talk, 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 talk. And all for the purpose of not communicating. That's the ego operating. Of course it's easy to knock the old ego, but you better have it or you are going to be out there never never land forever, lost and wandering around. You go through the world and you wander around this place that is nowhere. That is where you end up if your ego is not pretty intact. But the ego is like a disciple on Good Friday. It does not like this business about being crucified. The ego is never going to like it. So look out any time you hear someone talking glibly about transformation. Boy, transformation. Or boy, I'm going into analysis. It is actually very scary once you go into this process, as if it is Good Friday and you don't know about the resurrection. We like to think that Jesus knew about the resurrection in advance, and all the disciples too. But the fact is, the archetypal nature of this process is that before any transformation, no one knows how it will turn out. That makes it scary and easy to fall into the grips of what Campbell called the tyrant holdfast. This is the power in us that holds on for dear life. That is the attitude that says, I am not going to change. This is the person who gets into psychotherapy and stays two months. Have you had therapy? Yes. How long? How many sessions did you have? Nine. That's all I needed. Everything's fine now, of course. I still have all this psychosomatic stomach trouble, but I'm okay. Everything is fine. This applies to most of us. Another part of this avoidance of transformation is drug stores and value. The American people are Valium junkies. Valium is a dangerous drug. Why? Because doctors are putting so many people on it. Recent studies show the number of religious houses in the Roman Catholic Church in which most of the people are on Valium. We have these studies because Roman Catholics are more honest about studying the lives of their own leaders than a lot of the rest of us. I was totally unaware of this until I got to know my family better recently and found out how many of my own relatives were on Valium. Why? The doctors pass out like sugar pills. It is one way to keep the people drugged up so that they do not have to go into therapy or look for other transformative experiences. There are many other ways we try to ensure that people can avoid these initiatory experiences. Many Jungians believe that a lot of the drug maintenance of severely emotionally ill people serves this purpose of avoidance. Contrary to popular belief, a nervous breakdown often needs to happen because the psychological structure is malformed and needs to be restructured. We are not willing, however, to provide enough opportunities for transformation for such people. With proper settings and resources to help them through the experience, so we avoid the fact that transformation is needed. So what do we do? We drug them. Much of what passes for mental health therapy is actually drug therapy, and this will probably continue to be true for the next 20 or 30 years. This is not therapy. It is institutional enchantment and not a positive thing like the song Some Enchanted Evening, but more like a fairy tale. It is a sleep, a killing fog that lies over life. Our lives are heavily enchanted by unconsciousness and we do a lot to try to keep this enchantment going because it is so painful and costly to try to do anything about it to get disenchanted. Disenchantment begins with the middle phase. In Campbell's stories, this is where you meet the frog turned into a prince, the ugly hag turned into a beautiful princess. When you relate to these situations correctly, it is a process of disenchantment. The fairy tale Iron Hans, for example, tells how a young man, through this process of ordeals, is able to meet his responsibilities and come out and take his role, while the king, who has been enchanted, is released and set free. This is the process of disenchantment or disenthrallment. When you get over the first threshold, according to Campbell, there are always ordeals. We'll get to that more with Victor Turner. There's always ritual humiliation here and usually a wounding of some form, scarring or scarification. This is when you get the scars on the chest with the American Indians. Why did human beings cut the skin during these periods? 
Think about that. Why did they engage in so much symbolic wounding during transformative process? Audience comment. It was marking of the moment. I was paying attention to the place where the human being was. More. Very good. That's correct. In other words, any time you're in the presence of what a Jungian would call the self, you turn up the light to see more clearly the radical significance of the moment. It is marked in a way that shows it is serious. What else? Audience comment. Something had to be released. More. Yes, usually blood. It indicates a spiritual reality. You can be cut all to pieces, but if it does not represent what is happening inside, it does not work. This was the understanding of pre-modern human beings. They thought mythically and magically. At our best, we can learn from them. They believed that if they could somehow show what is going to happen, they could help it happen. That explains the great interest now in the vision quest. Sending people out by themselves without food and water and letting them suffer a bit. It explains the great unconscious interest in violent sports and war. There is no way to understand the attractiveness of war without understanding the unconscious seduction of the archetype of initiation. Audience comment. Breaking the egg. More. Breaking the egg. Another useful symbol for initiation. There is a wonderful scene in a movie entitled Breaking Loose. I think where the mother has this glass or crystal egg and it gets tossed around at the end of the movie and it gets cracked. Symbolizing initiation. If your cosmic egg doesn't have a crack in it, you haven't been initiated. Audience comment. It seems ridiculous. More. It does seem ridiculous. In fact, a lot of this stuff that happens in this middle phase seems ridiculous from the point of view of the ego. That's the role of the clown and the trickster. You can see how naive we are in contemporary culture because we don't understand the importance of the ridiculous very well. We just think it's peripheral. We don't realize that it is necessary for change, for deep structural transformation. You made a key point about the scarification showing what is happening inside because there is a tearing of perfection in this suffering. It is meant to deal with one's grandiosity. There is a certain kind of ego inflation that develops with any kind of status. It is very difficult not to get inflated in any status in terms of entitlement. What you think you deserve and what you can expect and what people owe you. And you can see this in almost every part of contemporary life. Think how it operates in marriage how inflation is almost inevitable, and the ego has to get brought down some way. This middle phase also has, according to Campbell, the encounter with magical helpers. In other words, there is always an assumption that you are not alone in this adventure. Whenever you get into a place like this, you start looking for helpers. If you are not looking for help, then you probably have not entered that kind of space and time. You may not know that you are looking for help, this is like the people who go to college and major in psychology, and people who become psychologists, or people who go into religious vocations, people who say, I'm going to be a minister and help other people. In many cases, they are looking for someone to help them, but since no one has helped them understand that they were looking for someone to help them, they become helpers themselves so they can get help. This is what Lee Roloff calls the me search and the research. It usually takes seminarians until their first quarter of clinical pastoral education before this insight dawns on them, but magical helpers do appear. Jungians talk a lot about the idea of synchronicity. Isn't it interesting, Jungians always say, how just about the time you thought there wasn't any hope, suddenly you run into this particular book. For example, Morton Kelsey or John Sanford or Carl Jung or you meet someone personally. Of course, these things just happen and can easily be considered accidents, but they tell you something you need to know at that time. Helpers appear along the way, but they cannot do the work. They just provide assistance, a little guidance, an elixir of life is usually gained. However, because there is something precious to be found here in this space, mythology is just replete with this, and the New Testament is full of this. The pearl of great price is out here, or something like that and you discover this treasure. If you are lucky and get the right help and have the right amount of courage, then you try to return to the world outside the labyrinth, outside the cave with the treasure. Several things can happen to block you. Campbell also discusses the failure of initiation. An initiation can fail. 
I always say that the person either did not get cooked enough or perhaps got overdone. You take one look at the situation and say, no, this is too hard. This happens a lot with seminarians, people who plan to go into the ministry. They are really excited about going into the ministry until they have their first church experience. But when they see what it's really like, all of a sudden they get interested in doing something else. In other cases, young ministers do not get their grandiosity dealt with before they leave the seminary, and they go out into the world with the boon or the precious gift or the elixir of life, and they work themselves as if they were divine. And this is where we get what is known today in the popular parlance as clergy burnout. The burnout phenomenon among helpers is nothing in the world but ego inflation and failed initiation. Most of us in the helping professions are still a little inflated. How many helpers of any form do you know who really take care of themselves? Not many, percentage-wise. Most of them are would-be heroes riding toward burnout. So another way to destroy your vocation is to get so inflated that you burn out. And of course that destroys the boon, because there is no more to go around. You have killed the goose that laid the golden egg. In addition, a lot of pseudo-initiatory behavior is merely persona posturing. Anyone who goes on a vision quest for a good time is persona. There's a lot of temptation to that. Jungian analysts often say that dreams about clothes or changing clothes reveal persona issues. How you want to appear or change the way you present yourself to others, when actually what is being dealt with here may not be persona at all. Audience comment. The marking of the initiation scar has a humility aspect to it. More. Yes. The leveling that occurs is one of the chief marks. The initiates, the people who are being initiated, are all alike in terms of status. They don't have any. If you are truly in this kind of space, in a container, a vessel that is holding you, it is holding you to your suffering. Now think carefully about that. The container holds you to your suffering. What would happen if there were not enough of a containing wall there around you? Well, what do we do? We split off from our suffering and we become great. It is what we call a manic defense. In the manic depressive bipolar disorder, a person becomes manic to avoid facing the pain and the depression under it. In other words, just because you are in a transition state does not mean you are going to get initiated. Once you have the eyes to see it, you will notice a lot of failed initiation around you, and you will probably notice some failed initiations in your own life. Like so many of us today, you probably did not have access to the right kind of containment and ritual elder leadership that you needed when you needed them. You don't need this just any time, you need it when you need it. You cannot just decide, well today, I think I'm going to be initiated. I think I'll call up the local initiation hotline. That is not the way it works. The leveling aspect of initiation is very important. Without adequate containment, you most likely think you are wonderful. These people get really inflated, they think they are God's gift to the world. They have just discovered this religious truth, and they are going to start their own religion. That comes from this phase when you do not have adequate containment and you lose your sense of being leveled. In the process of true initiation, however, you realize and accept the leveling. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have, or how much money you have, or how famous you are. Initiation strips you down to nothing. And you know that at bottom, or as we say before God, there is no difference in status. Mercia Iliadi The historian of religions, Mercia Iliadi, has made important contributions to our understanding of initiation in his many books, especially the sacred and the profane, patterns in comparative religion, and rites and symbols of initiation. His basic thesis is that all human space-time is heterogeneous, that is, it exists in two different forms, a ordinary profane space and time which he believes modern people live in almost all the time, and b sacred space and time that only tribal pre-industrial peoples could access at certain times. The Greeks make a similar distinction between Kronos, clock time, and Kairos, significant time. Iliadi believed that modern people do not have access to this sacred space and time. Victor Turner helped us see past Iliadi's view on this point. My own research has also found that modern human beings can indeed experience this heterogeneity of space and that whether we realize it or not, our space and time 
is also bifurcated into these two types, the profane and the sacred. Once you look at it, you can see it. Iliadi studied deeply the workings of the pre-modern mind. He believed tribal cultures always perceived the world to be in a process of deteriorating, running down, and they needed to get in touch with special sacred space and time to get the cosmos regenerated. That explains the annual renewal cycles and fertility rites. Unless you did your rituals, the world would just run down. The herds would stop giving birth and the crops would stop growing. This caused all these magical rituals to be done at certain times of the year. According to astrology in most ancient cultures, with the year divided in time by key natural events, for example, each year you need to invoke the eternal return of spring, connect with what the Australian Aborigines called the dream time, in order to facilitate regeneration, you needed to locate the center of the world. According to Iliade, the center of the world is always in this sacred space, what he called the Access Mundi, the center of the world, the world tree. In Christian thinking, the cross is the center of the universe, the Axis Mundi, the world tree. Through the cross of Christ, the nourishment of God passes to the world. If you look at Roman Catholic liturgical theology, you can see the archetypal symbolic structure underlying it very clearly here. The mass nourishes, but where does it nourish from? The divine spiritual nourishment comes through that Axis Mundi, that sacred navel of the universe, which was the cross. For Iliade, the structure of initiation is in the special sacred space and time where you get connected to the divine sources. A Roman Catholic Christian finds this sacred space in the Mass as the Holy of Holies. This accounts for the archetypal importance of the priesthood and why it is such a controversial issue today. The eternal return is the connection with what Iliadi called regenerative space and time because it is the only space and time that can renew the person. Profane space and time, which exists outside sacred space and time, is always deteriorating. Slowly perhaps, but always deteriorating and ordinary. Ordinary is how you feel when you wake up in the morning. Ordinary time is never when you want it to be. We can apply this to our relationships, for example, because we so often feel they are ordinary. When a relationship gets ordinary, look out. If you are not doing something in a relationship to connect with these renewing energies, you better watch out. Often someone else will come along to consolate this space and time for one of the persons in the ordinary relationship. This is what extramarital affairs are about, sacred space and time. Sexual acting out is one way of getting into that kind of place. At the Archetypal Foundation, similar dynamics exist beneath the mass and extramarital affairs. That should surprise you a bit. But to understand why people do what they do, you need to understand these archetypal materials in the structure of initiation. People do what they do because they are hungry for renewal. To shift my hat to that of the theologian for a second, I think this is why Jesus was so radically accepting of so-called sinners. At bottom, there is a spiritual quest behind practically every form of self-destructive acting out. From substance abuse to sexual abuse of all kinds, there is a sort of spiritual quest for initiation. Jungians can help people see the spiritual quest that lies at the heart of every symptom. Iliadi assumes that when you do contact the center of the world, this access moody, this sacred space with these divine powers, that regeneration does occur and the world becomes revitalized so life can go on enhanced with new creativity present. His works are replete with this idea which he documents over and over again from the whole history of world cultures. His three volume series of books called A History of Religious Ideas traces this pattern throughout the history of human religion. Iliadi himself is very frail right now but he will try to stay alive until he finishes those books. He is working away at it now. Studying his work provides a vocabulary, a symbolism that helps interpret many things. It is one of the best ways to get a sense for the symbols, for example, that come up in dreams. For instance, what does it mean when the sun comes up in your dreams? Victor Turner Probably the most important theorist for our study is Victor Turner, who built on the work of Vanjanop and Iliadi to describe the tripartite structure of ritual process and initiation. 
He helped us to understand that Iliadi was wrong to say that moderns could not experience it, for modern people do indeed experience different kinds of space and time. Turner talked about this in terms of structure and anti-structure, old structure, destructuring, and the new structure. He used the word liminal for the middle transition phase because liminal was his word for sacred space. Thus, the first phase for Turner was preliminal, and the third phase was post-liminal. Turner's book, The Ritual Process, lays out this basic approach in a straightforward way. Victor Turner and I were friends who worked together on some of this material. A conference that I planned entitled Ritual and Human Adaptation related his work to many issues in psychology and theology. The conference proceedings were published in 1983 as a volume of Zygon, the Journal of Religion and Science, so they are still available. Right before Turner's death in 1983, he came out as a Jungian. He gave a major address on body, brain, and culture, in which he said that Jungian psychology was the best psychology available for understanding the relationship between the structure of the brain and human ritual in its relationship to human transformation. Even though I had invited Turner to give this lecture and I knew his work was compatible with Jungian thought, I had no idea that he would make this sort of open endorsement in this lecture. Here was an outstanding, world-famous anthropologist giving a lecture to the Oriental Institute in Chicago and making this bridge between anthropology and psychology through Jungian thought. I believe that this was a historic moment in furthering the science of psychoanalysis and ritual. Turner described a special kind of social organization known as communitas that tends to exist in this liminal phase in sacred time and space where people treat each other in a different way. People do not relate the same way in liminal space and time that they do in structured space and time. Turner pointed out that the Marxist ideal of a classless society is a mythic vision that comes out of the human experience of liminality and communitas. This is the same mythic vision behind religious orders in Roman Catholicism and other faiths. The reality of life in religious orders may not always rise to that exalted level, much to the chagrin of many people there, but it sometimes does. Many Protestant congregations also have the same vision, and sometimes it happens there. What are the marks of communitas, the social organization that exists in the sacred space of the middle phase of initiation? People really get a sense of being equal before God or before the sacred. You don't have to be a theist to be in this space, however, because here you get a profound sense of humanness. People in this kind of space and time are not so judgmental of each other. That is where you get the acceptance that we're always talking about and longing for. You get this in religious places, yes, but where else do you get it? In many popular places of entertainment, like music concerts, honky tonks, and blues bars, it is related to the origins of Mardi Gras and other cultural carnivals. We have missed the religious function of much popular and even anti-social behavior. That is why it is so important for Jungians to emphasize Pay attention to all the shadow stuff because it's spiritually significant and you cannot just deny it. If you try to do away with it, you're just playing games. The repressed is going to return. You cannot understand what is so attractive about nightclubs if you don't understand the concept of communitas. You cannot understand what is so attractive to people about music concerts. This is one of the ritual dimensions manifest in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. These extraordinary spaces are not always moral spaces. I once went to a Willie Nelson concert. I was thinking about these theories that I was teaching in my other life, and I looked at this scene, and I could not believe my eyes. What did we have here? Thousands of people stoned out of their minds in this huge amphitheater, packed to the gills, horribly uncomfortable. Do you know what people go through at rock concerts? It helps you understand ritual humiliation. Why else would people go out and lie on the ground in mud to listen to music? It's a ritual humiliation for a lot of people. This may sound humorous, but I'm serious. Here I am in this huge amphitheater with these totally uncomfortable people packed in like sardines. Toward the end of the concert, Willie cranks up not Whiskey River Tick My Mind, but Amazing Grace. Now what happened? Have any of you ever seen this? No one says, Take out your cigarette lighter and light it, but thousands of cigarette lighters came on all over the amphitheater, and the house lights dim, and Willie is singing, and everybody is singing, Amazing Grace. The spiritual energy in that air was so thick you could cut it with a knife. The power, the religious power of those moments. 
My friends who know more about rock than I do say this often happens at rock concerts. It is more powerful than anything I ever saw in a house of worship, more powerful than I ever saw anywhere. The pop musician plays a role in our culture that is fundamentally, archetypally religious. Only the concept of communitas can explain how it works. You may not like the religion that they are selling because it is a different god or a different divine energy, but it is still fundamentally and structurally religious. You cannot identify lawyers or doctors or truck drivers at one of those things. You cannot tell anything about people's social status. Research on this subject can take you to strange places. Churches, by contrast, are far more socially segregated, more likely to be persona restoring than transformative. One of the tragedies of religious life in the world today is that it is fundamentally a persona endeavor with so little concern for the basic human realities. It helps people paint up, clean up, fix up, and look better than they are. Confession is more abundant in almost every religious tradition, and my own tradition of Protestantism is at its worst in this area. Protestantism has no place for serious confession. A sort of radical honesty happens in the communitas place that once existed in the Christian tradition when confession functioned archetypally and brought back what had been split off. Unfortunately, most religious institutions today do not understand this. To revitalize our religious institutions today, we must address the problem of how to provide this kind of sacred space again for our people and not force them to seek it in places that do not have responsible ritual and religious elders. I love Willie Nelson dearly, but his focused purpose is not providing ritual leadership for ethical and spiritual transformation. I'm sure he would be the first to tell you that. He might be aware of the religious aspect of his performances, but he also realizes it is not his place to assume the responsibilities of providing ritual leadership for individual transformations. Thus, we have a weird situation in the world today. The religious institutions in which I include professional therapy should be evoking and stewarding sacred space and moderating it, but they are not doing much of it very well. This forces people to have to bootleg it, to get it on the side, so to speak, and act it out unconsciously, and this causes a lot of trouble and a lot of destructiveness in their lives. We Jungians, I think, must accept it as part of our vocation to speak these insights to religious institutions around the world and not just to Christian ones. Think about the way Islamic religious institutions function in world culture today. Spiritual leaders, of which I count myself one, are failing the human race now because we have lost the ancient wisdom about the initiatory process and we so often offer pseudo-initiation. The whole process of Catechesis in the mainline Christian traditions has lost its original cycle's active power. It rarely penetrates down into the deep levels that some of these rock concerts do. This is extremely destructive. Young people are not stupid. They may be uninformed, but there is a difference between being uninformed and being stupid. They can sense what has mana, power, and what doesn't. You cannot fool people about that. When you plug a radio into an outlet and it works, you know there is electricity in that outlet. When it doesn't, you know there isn't. It's pretty clear. So for many young people today, when they plug into their youth activities at church, they often discover that there isn't anything there. Click, 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 nothing. Then they plug into the Rolling Stones or the latest group, Madonna or whatever, and they can tell there is some real juice there. We are fooling ourselves if we don't see this problem. Audience member. Do you have any comments about these spirituality programs that give young people an intense weekend experience? More. Some of the programs in Christian spirituality are powerful. They're needed. They are an important response to the situation. The main problem with so many programs of Christian spirituality is that they try to act as if there isn't a shadow. Even Morton Callisey tends to be guilty of this. His books give you the idea that if you're good enough, your shadow just sort of gets baptized and transformed, and it isn't a shadow anymore. Same way with my friends who are evangelical Christians, and I don't knock them because they are my folks down home, but they get saved for a while and then the shadow gets them. And when the shadow gets an evangelical Christian, it doesn't mess around. Similarly, it's like a priest whose shadow gets him, or a sister whose shadow gets her. We have this 
Mexican jumping bean phenomenon in Christian spirituality. The polar opposites take turns manifesting. Jung call this Anatio Jomia. Most forms of Christian spirituality try to deny the shadow. John Sanford comes the closest to acknowledging the shadow as the shadow, and even he waffles, because a lot of people he lectures to would get disturbed if he told them the truth. That is the problem. We tend to be Manachians, that is, we tend to be so split with regard to our humanness that we advocate angelism. We wish we could forget about our bodies and sexuality, and our aggressive urges, and all the parts of us that are not nice. You see this coming out in so many ways. We get this in all sorts of ways in the Christian community, from the evangelical Christians and the Roman Catholic spirituality people. Another example is the liberation theologians who think they are such transformation leaders. The interesting thing is the way they don't have a shadow, for example. Did you ever meet a person active in the peace movement who would admit to having an aggressive warrior shadow? No, of course not. This is where the Jungian point of view is so important. Because if you don't face your shadow, you will project it, and you will act it out in ways that you are not consciously responsible for, and people all around you are going to get hurt, including you. This is the challenge, and this is where we are right now today. We have got to find ways to help people face up to what this quest for wholeness entails. It doesn't finally help people to teach them that they can just tame the shadow and strain it out of their life and do away with it. Our fantasy so often is, give it to Satan, let it be his. That might be nice in a way if it were true, but the history of human spiritual experience, including the experience of individual Christians, indicates otherwise. That approach to religion produces scapegoating and unconscious acting out. A deep split in the individual's personality and approach to life and perceptions of others. It's very paranoid and also very arrogant and inflated. It's also extremely sadistic toward the people who carry the projection of your shadow. In the New Testament Gospels, if you read them closely, Jesus did not engage in that kind of splitting and he constantly contended with people who thought they were holy. So we have a problem in the world today because all the different religions, not just Christianity, are not addressing the requirements of this kind of archetypal structure and the realities it represents in human life. If you understand this, you realize that when human beings get into a place in life when they need this kind of space, they don't say to themselves, I'm going to go out and find myself some sacred space because they don't know this kind of language and neither do most of their leaders. What does happen? An archetypal imperative puts them on a quest and into a transition state. This is what happens in the midlife crisis. Suddenly someone who up to now has been an upstanding citizen, perfectly sane, happily married, a responsible member of the Presbyterian Church, for example, probably an elder, suddenly he just goes nuts. What has really happened to him is that he has just heard the call. He instinctively starts out on that quest. If he's lucky, he will find some containment, somewhere to deal with all the transformation and metamorphosis that's trying to happen in him. Most of the time, we are not that lucky. We find some other unlucky human being, a woman or a man depending on our preference, and invest them with magical qualities, right? That's what happens in the romantic expression of this. When I'm in this space, if I'm a man, and I run into a woman, she's not just a woman, she is the goddess. I have just run into the goddess and she is just glowing with 220,000 volts now. It doesn't occur to me that this is not true love, or that it is really not even sexual. I'm looking for someone to contain me in my quest. That's why the erotic side of this pattern is so powerful. But of course, no human being outside of some ritual context can contain this. Why do you think that it is so common for a person in counseling either with a clergyman or a therapist of any type to try to get the counselor into a sexual relationship? Trying to seduce the counselor is an extremely widespread phenomenon. What is going on in these situations? Too many therapists think that erotic transference is simply some devious attempt to destroy the therapy. It is not that at all. It is this ritual phenomenon making itself known. If therapists have enough understanding to know that this is a sacred relationship, then they will know enough not to act it out and let it destroy the container. 
destroy the vessel. But what often happens is that the container is not tight enough. The ritual elder responsible for maintaining the boundaries does not properly maintain the boundaries. That's why you have so many clergy involved in sexual relationships with their parishioners. It's a quest for this kind of powerful, regenerative, renewed relatedness. Later we will consider how analysis must be approached in order to be transformative. Therapy has to be more than just a profession. The challenge of a therapist is deeper than just professional functioning. What a counselor enacts in a therapeutic context or any minister in a pastoral counseling is none other than this archetypal process of initiation with all the pitfalls and promises that a sacred vocation entails. Audience member. Many Christians have underestimated the shadow and then get very concerned when the shadow keeps reappearing. How can you help people who get trapped into that? More. You just have to explain to them that they have been misled on the issue of the shadow, that these forces are more powerful than they realize. These are archetypal, primordial forces. The human being is never what the persona wants to appear. Audience member. But many people interpret this as evil. More. That's right. Because they have the shadow mixed up with evil and Satan. That's the sad part. In my view, the shadow is where so much of the true self still exists. If you make the shadow evil, then you condemn a person to live the rest of their lives split. We need to address the practical side of trying to get people healed. Getting healed is a wrenching, lifelong process. I sometimes despair of ever getting healed myself. We all know what we are talking about in trying to heal all these splits in our personalities and try and knit ourselves together into some kind of wholeness and some kind of acceptance and loving of the split off shadow side of ourselves. The dynamics of the true self and the false self are related to this. In psychoanalytic terms, the shadow contains a great deal of the true self, and when you make that into evil, you've done a terrible disservice to people. Much that passes for Christian spirituality today does this. I teach psychology and spirituality in a seminary, and I constantly have to tell students to be careful reading texts of spirituality, because a lot of it is not good for your health. This is not just for seminarians. You don't have to be a seminary to have problems with your sexuality or your self-esteem. It can be a problem to anyone if your mother and father did not cherish your body when you were a little infant. And this is true for a large percentage of us. Few of us were so lucky to have had parents that really did relate to us physically as infants. Statistically, most people were parented by people who themselves did not have a good relationship with their bodies because their parents didn't have a good relationship with their bodies and so on all the way back so you can't blame them. These kinds of experiences form the psychological and developmental roots of maniacism, and this is also behind a lot of nihilism today and preoccupation with war. We are so enraged deep down about the way we were rejected physically in childhood that part of us wants to blow the world up. Of course, we don't accept this consciously, so we project it onto all those violent people out there. At some point, we all had the experiences of not being held and cherished and taken delight in, but responded to with revulsion because of the way we behaved or smelled. That kind of parenting taught us that we were repulsive, shameful creatures. It wounded our body images. Then, of course, we are expected to affirm our bodies and be very sexual and relate humanly and sexually as adults. Just try to count the number of people you know who have no conflicts in this area in spite of all the sex therapists, all the Masters and Johnson stuff. Much sex therapy is as shallow as it can be, and does not even begin to touch the underlying developmental problem. It happened early. In summary, we got split emotionally, and so much of the erotic was put into the shadow. Then religion continues to support the splitting off of the body, and touch as shadowy or even interpret it as evil. What we need is an incarnation theology, that teaches the redemption of the body, but what we have is what is known as a theology of doceticism. There is some effort now in both Christian and Jewish circles to try to redeem the body, but we still have a long way to go. What we have is a continuation of this early narcissistic wound and its institutional support. It's tragic. The problem must be addressed in healing circles. Christian spirituality groups are working on this, but the issue of shadow is really the fly in the ointment and something that must be addressed. That's where you need the more serious Jungian perspective 
because you never thought you could clean up, paint up, and fix up the shadow. Audience comment. Somehow I, I see a danger in removing the notion of evil from the shadow, my own personal shadow. There may be some interjects that don't belong there, and those are of course easy, because there's nothing I can do about it, because they are a part of me I can integrate more. There is an archetypal shadow, but the shadow in itself is not evil. The evil is the process of splitting itself, which leads to a projection and scapegoating. There are certainly things that cannot be integrated. For example, the self with a capital S can never be integrated. Often developmentally there are some interjects that are so toxic that they cannot be integrated either. The British object relations theorists Fairbarn and Guntrip talk about the anti-libidinal ego, part of each of us that is so discouraged and so full of hate that it wants you dead and wants the world destroyed. That part cannot be integrated and probably cannot be healed. But it is not necessarily evil in the sense that theologians mean. It is understandable why it is there and until you can be compassionate with that part of yourself, you probably won't be able to deal with it adequately in just your ordinary living. The part of you that wants you dead is easy to see. I could talk with each of you for a short time and we could find the part of you that wants you dead. The part of you that doesn't want you to be happy. The part of you that wants to destroy your friendships. The part of you that wants to destroy all your relationships. The part of you that does not want you to have any pleasure or joy in life. It is there in every one of us, a greater or lesser toxicity. You had enough bad experiences as a child to give great justification for that part of you. But that part of you is the rebel with a cause. You can have compassion for it. You can talk to it. You can dialogue with it. But you must confront it. You must stand up to it.